Okay. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight is going to be part four of our deep dive study of the Sri Mala Devi Sutra, otherwise known as the Lion's Roar of Queen Sri Mala. Um, since this is part four, we don't need to discuss too much of what has happened already. But there's a few things that I want to mention as we kind of ease into this talk tonight. And it's, it's going to come up sooner or later tonight. So I figured I'd actually start uh, with just a little preliminary remarks about this sutra. This is also going to just be a simple introduction to the sutra if you happen to be here for the first time. Um, so the sutra that we're reading, this beautiful Sri Mala Devi Sutra, it is a Mahayana Buddhist sutra. And as I've mentioned, it's part of a collection of Mahayana Buddhist sutras. But what exactly does that mean, a Mahayana Buddhist sutra? So I, I want to start with that um, and kind of talk about this in a way that I may not have um, before. One second. So yeah, so a way that I may not have spoken about this before, but you know, this sutra, it, it this sutra is a, a Mahayana sutra and you can know it's a Mahayana sutra. There's a few, few very obvious ways and then a few more, more, more subtle ways. But what I really wanna get across it tonight is that this sutra, it's very aware of being a sutra. So that's one of the aspects of Mahayana sutras is that they're actually aware and they present an awareness of themselves as a, as a text, as a sutra, that's part of this larger genre of literature, let's say. It's borrowing on tropes, it's borrowing metaphors and, and all of these different things. And what I mean to say is, is this, if you're familiar with sutras in general, you'll recognize, you'll recognize these books, right? So this is more or less with some omissions. This is, these are all the sutras from the earliest Buddhist tradition. So the, the so-called Pali Canon, this is only one part of the whole Canon. You know, we're missing many other parts of it. But as far as sutras go, go, this is, you know, about it. Many, many hundreds of sutras, many, many hundreds of teachings of the Buddha. They say 84,000, they're not that far off. But the idea is, is that all of those sutras that I just showed you, they do seem to be the records of things somebody said. <laughs> they're, they're just sort of like, thus have I heard, once the Buddha was at this such and such a place, and he said this, and then they wrote it down, you know? And, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe they uh, passed these stories around orally for a while. But my point is, is that when you read these sutras, their teachings and their records of the teachings of the Buddha. And they basically just present themselves as what the Buddha said, even if it contains, say, a narrative or a story element, it's still going to be uh, a record of a story or a record of a telling of a story that way. What I'm getting at is, is that the Mahayana Buddhist tradition is after all of this and it knows that it's after all of this and so what i'm getting at is is that mahayana sutras are kind of this second generation literature that you know it has a sort of extended doctrine if you will an extended teaching more emphasis on emptiness, more emphasis on dependent origination. But when it comes to our sutra here tonight, 
one of the things that I wanted to mention was to remind you of how this all started. This sutra begins with a very simple premise, which is that Queen Srimala, her parents, King uh, Prasanajit, and wife Malika, the queen Malika, the sutra starts with this kind of story about the king and the queen who have just uh, converted to the Dharma. They've just kind of uh, become Buddhists in that way. And they think, you know, our daughter, Queen Srimala, is really smart. If we tell her about the Dharma, she'll get it for sure. And so this sutra, you know, and try to follow me here, this sutra that we're reading starts with the king and the queen writing a letter and sending it to Queen Srimala. And what that letter is, the king and the queen send a letter to Srimala and extolling... <laughs> the Dharma, <laughs> extolling the, the message of these sutras. And so sort of that's the first shift that we see in this as a Mahayana Sutra, that the, in a way the king and the queen are telling Queen Srimala about the Dharma, about the message of the Buddha, but this is after the fact. And so what I'm getting at, I'm not doing the best job of it, but there's a really, really beautiful thing going on with this sutra in particular, where it's in a way commenting on Mahayana Buddhism and the way that it works and just sort of its relationship to the earlier message. So I wanted to point that out and also just as a review of how this all got started. So the king and the queen sent Srimala a letter, Srimala reads the letter and basically has a vision of the Buddha. And then in this kind of ecstatic visionary state, she recites a poem. And now this is where things start to get really uh, recursive in a sense, where the story, it has now become a poem and then, of course, where this gets really performative, in a sense, is a kind of recognition that one has that when one is reading the poem of Queen Srimala, you are now participating in the sutra, in a way. So this is a way that Mahayana sutras kind of operate in a very different way than the earlier sutras. Again, these Mahayana sutras, they're aware that they're stories, they're aware that they're being read. So they are speaking to the, to the reader that they know will be on the other end of this, of this writing. Even they know, even if this writing were to be sealed in a jar for a thousand years, it doesn't matter because the sutra knows the minute somebody cracks it open, the sutra is going to be talking to that person. And it's aware of that. And it's also, these are, uh, sutras are also aware of the mysterious nature of language itself, how communication happens at all. So all of this is again to kind of speak to what does it mean to say this is a Mahayana Buddha Sutra? We're going to find out a few more things tonight that really separate or, uh, yeah, set this off as a Mahayana Sutra. But I just wanted to start with that. So it's kind of a re uh, an, an interesting relationship to the early Dharma, where this is aware of that early Dharma. And of course, this Sutra is, is obviously aware of that earlier Dharma because of this very title. So this title that it is the Sri Mali, Sri Mala Devi Simha Nada Sutra, the lion's roar of Queen Sri Mala. So this is definitely where we know, oh yeah, this is a second generation, call it, or a Mahayana Buddha Sutra, because it's aware of this tradition 
that is called The Lion's Roar. So I wanted to do a little bit of talking about The Lion's Roar. Um, I've been de debating about whether to do that now or later, and I think I'm going to do it now just because it fits into, um, well, it fits into me talking about the polycanon. So if you're interested, and I didn't talk about this in the opening night when I talked about the title, but if, if you are interested, like I was interested, in knowing well, what is all of this lion's roar business all about? Well, a really, really good place to go to find out about that is the so-called middle length discourses of the Buddha, right? The Majjhima Nikaya. And if you go to the Majjhima Nikaya, what's interesting is that this collection of sutras is divided into different groupings. And the second grouping is actually called the Maha Simhanada section. It's a whole section on the lion's roar. There's the great discourse on the lion's roar. There's the shorter discourse or sutra on the lion's roar. And then there's a bunch of other smaller sutras that the compilers of this collection decided to fit all together under the theme of the lion's roar. And if you go through all of these uh, lion's roar sutras, like I did, you can, you can kind of start to get a, um, a through line, call it, or a thread. You can start to see like, well, what makes a lion's roar sutra a lion's roar sutra? Um, there's a few different kind of themes that I've detected. Um, I'm not going to go too into those themes uh, right now. I'm going to go into them a little bit later. But the thing about it is, is that if you go into the Majjhima Nikaya and read that section, there's one very important sutra that's missing, that's not in the Majjhima Nikaya. So if you really want to find the origin of this lion's roar business, then you got to go over to the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses. And as a lot of you know, this is one of my favorite collections of the Pali Canon. Um, what I've come to realize, and I realize it more and more, kind of uh, the more research I do, this collection definitely has the earliest suttas. So you may or may not know this, but the big stack of books I've been holding up, they're not chronological. They're not in the order in which the Buddha gave them. They're actually essentially in an order of importance, frankly. They, they go from the, what was considered the most important and then all the way down to kind of the miscellaneous in a way. And so what I mean to say is, is that if you dig out your... Samyutta Nikaya, and you go all the way to the 22nd section and the 78th sutra of the 22nd section, you'll find a little sutra that's called the lion. And this is, a, it's a very, very short sutra. Um, yeah, I, I'm almost tempted to just read it. It's kind of lovely. It'll give you the, the basic idea of the theme. It's only a few paragraphs, and I'm not going to even read it in its entirety. But the sutra, it basically is thus have I heard one time at Shravasti, the Buddha said, Bhikkhus, in the evening, the lion, the king of beasts, comes out from his lair. Having come out, he stretches himself, surveys the four quarters all around, and roars his lion's roar three times. Then he sets out in search of game. When the lion, the king of beasts, roars, whatever animals hear the sound are for the most part filled with fear, a sense of urgency, sense of terror. Those who live in holes enter their holes. Those who live in the water enter the water. Those who live in the woods enter the woods and the birds fly up into the air. 
Even those royal bull elephants bound by strong thongs in the villages, towns, and capital cities burst and break their bonds asunder, frightened. They urinate and defecate themselves, fleeing in fear. So powerful, Bhikkhus, is the lion, the king of beasts, among the animals, so majestic and mighty. So too, Bhikkhus, when the Tathagata, the thus come one, arises in the world, an arhat, perfectly enlightened, accomplished in true knowledge and conduct, fortunate knower of the world, unsurpassed leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of, of gods and humans, the enlightened one, the blessed one. He teaches the Dharma thus, such is form, such is its origin, such is its passing away, such is sensation, such is its origin, such is its passing away, such is perception, such is its origin, such is its passing away, such is the conditioning, samskara, such is its origin, such is its passing away, and such is consciousness, such is its origin, such, such is its passing away. Then bhikkhus, when those devas who are long lived, beautiful, adorned in happiness, dwelling for a long time in their lofty palaces. When they hear the Tathagata's teaching of the Dharma, they are for the most part filled with fear, a sense of urgency and terror, saying, it seems, sir, that we are impermanent, though we thought ourselves permanent. It seems, sir, that we are unstable, though we thought ourselves stable. It seems, sir, that we are not eternal, though we thought ourselves eternal. It seems, sir, that we are impermanent, unstable, non-eternal, all included within our sense of identity. So powerful, Bhikkhus, is the Tathagata over this world, together with its gods, so majestic and mighty. And then he repeats a beautiful verse that encapsulates that message. But that seems to be the original Lion's Roar Sutra that explains the metaphor. It gives you the reference of the Lion's Roar and how all the animals kind of run in fear and terror in that way. And then it gives you the beautiful compliment, which is, and so too, Bhikkhus, just as the lion arises in the evening, when a Buddha, a Tathagata, a fully enlightened one, arises in the world, dispenses this Dharma, this teaching, here it was formulated in terms of the five skandhas and the arising of the skandhas and the passing away of the skandhas, ultimately focusing on the message of impermanence. Now, the idea there is, is that's, sort of the teaching, if you will. You can think of it in terms of impermanence. You could also think of it in terms of anatta or anatman, the, no, the doctrine of no self. You could think of it in terms of emptiness as well. But the idea is, is that that message, the message of impermanence, message of emptiness, that message is this very powerful lion's roar that potentially sends some people running in fear. Oh, no, it can't be. I, I can't be impermanent. I can't be in that way. But then what's interesting about the, the Lion Sutra that I just read is that what it really references is, is actually the gods. And it's actually the devas, the gods, who thought they were eternal, who thought they were permanent, that it's they who, who is at their world who's actually shook the most in that way. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of start this evening with that idea that that's the lion's roar. It is a very definitive declaration of the essential teachings of Buddhism, basically. Again, either kind of impermanence on the one hand or emptiness on the other. And so that's the original one. It leads to kind of all of the other uh, lions or sutras that we hear in the, that collection. And 
it is kind of in reference to all of that, that this sutra happens. And so that was kind of a long, long introduction to yet another way in which this sutra, it's, it's very aware of that earlier Buddhist tradition. And I guess you could say that, or, or you could think of it, a good way to think of it is in the same way that Sri Mala Devi's parents, Prasanajit and Malika, in the same way that they wrote a letter extolling the Dharma, and then after getting that letter, Sri Mala gives a poem. She recites a poem celebrating the Dharma in a way. What I'm getting at is there's, there's a way in which Mahayana Buddhism is a grand celebration of the Dharma. And I guess what I'm kind of getting at is, is that this Mahayana teaching, the Mahayana Buddhism, it's not in opposition to this earlier tradition. In fact, Mahayana Buddhism is like a grand celebration of that earlier tradition. And so we've kind of heaped, you know, pardon the expression, but we've heaped a, more teachings on top of the original teaching, but we haven't gotten rid of the original teaching. Not at all. We're still celebrating that in a way. And not only that, we're using the tropes of the earlier tradition. We're using the, the format of a sutra, but in an interesting new way, where, for example, in our Sri Mala Devi Sutra, the Buddha is like, you know, Sri Mala has a vision of the Buddha. It says that the Buddha appears out of nowhere and she has this vision of the Buddha. And then, and then the Buddha's talking and we're having a whole sutra. And we have to remember, this is all taking place in Sri Mala land. <laughs> this is all like the Buddha is, is, a, is a fiction, is a phantasm in that way. So keep that, all of that in mind. Um, okay, before we kind of start really digging deeper into this, any, did that bring up any questions, comments, answers, or ideas? Awesome. Okay. So after chapter one, which really, you know, oh, well, so chapter one concludes, by the way, with the Buddha giving a vyakaranya, a prophecy that Sri Mala will eventually become a fully enlightened Buddha, her own Buddha land, and everybody that's in Queen Sri Mala's uh, palace or in her assembly, as it would be called, they all wish to be reborn in that pure land. And this is where I mentioned last week that it, you could read chapter two. That's what we read last week. So chapter two is this chapter of these 10 precepts. And I mentioned last week that there's a way of kind of reading between the lines or even reading between the chapters, so to speak. And there's a way of understanding like, oh, if, if you would like to be reborn in Queen Sri Mala's Buddha land when she becomes a Buddha, then it may behoove you to think about these 10 precepts in that way. Now, when we jump to chapter two, the chapter is called these 10 precepts or um, basically precepts. There are kind of rules in that way. And what I talked about last time is that those 10 precepts are these sort of these observances, I would call them, uh, precepts that they are understood to be on top of the original Buddhist uh, precepts. So not as a replacement of the 10 precepts of old school Buddhism, or if you're just a kind of a lay Buddhist and you're doing the five precepts. Last week, when we discussed the 10 precepts that Sri Mala takes or receives, actually, it was understood that those, those 10, right, this idea of not breaking precepts, respecting elders, not being desirous of other people's possessions, not being greedy. When we got into those, 
those were these kind of bodhisattva precepts that were on top of our normal moral discipline, on top of our normal shila, there are these extra precepts. And we noticed last week when we went through those 10, that they were all very focused on what could be called social engagement, being a socially engaged bodhisattva, and they're all about ways of interacting with others. And ultimately, especially the last five of those precepts, they all start to revolve around one central idea, which is an idea of harmonizing or embracing the Dharma, harmonizing and embracing people, sentient beings, in fact, all beings. And we're going to come back to that idea of embracing or harmonizing. But first, we're going to talk about chapter three. So now we're going to get into some fresh new material. So chapter three is called the three vows. And I think that's pretty much the standard translation, the three great vows, or just the three vows. In Chinese, it's just three, this, <laughs> yuan, the, the san yuan. So just these three vows. So before we get into the chapter and read it, we need to talk about the title of the chapter. We need to talk about what are, what does this mean? Okay. So this is actually, it's very much kind of at the heart of this sutra, I would say. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of elements of wisdom to this sutra, but this is not a pranya paramita sutra. So this is not really deep on the kind of the more heady, you know, emptiness dependent origination. This is actually, this sutra is very focused on this idea. And so we need to talk about what this idea means. So, in Sanskrit, we are to understand that th this would be called pranidana. And in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, pranidana is one of the paramitas, one of the perfections or one of the excellences or one of the practices of a bodhisattva. And this is where language starts to get tricky. Ooh, and language gets tricky for a, a bunch of different reasons. You may be, some of you may be already familiar with this idea of pranidana, um, and not from Buddhism, but perhaps from the world of Ashtanga yoga. So if you are familiar with the eight limbs of yoga, the Ashtanga yoga system, one of the limbs, one of the preliminary limbs, is what are called the niyamas, and there's five, and one of the niyamas is pranidana, but in particular, it's ishvara pranidana. And within classical Sanskrit, of which the Ashtanga yoga system is based, pranidana, it more or less means something like surrender. It would be actually very, within the classical Sanskrit tradition, it would be, yeah, it's this idea of surrendering the self. In particular, when you talk about Ishvara Pranidana, Ishvara is kind of like the Lord. It's kind of like God. And so Ishvara Pranidana is this kind of surrendering oneself to a higher power, as we might say. Now, I think it's actually very helpful to know the classic or classical Sanskrit meaning of this word. And forget the Chinese and forget that for now. We're just talking about this idea of pranidana. And pranidana as surrender 
that's what it means in the yoga world. But some of you, some of you may be aware that there's something called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. And this is kind of, I don't want to get too into this because we'd be here all night, but it's, you should know that within the world of Buddhist studies, within the world of Buddhism, when Buddhism migrates away from using this language called Pali and starts moving towards this more, uh, uh, what do I want to call it? Formal, classical language of Sanskrit. So when Buddhism moves away from Pali and to Sanskrit, it actually, it takes a lot of the meaning of the words as they are in Pali and brings them into their use of them in Sanskrit. And they actually scholars have a special name for that. Again, they call it Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit because it's not exactly Sanskrit. The meanings of a lot of words don't quite mean what they mean in classical Sanskrit. They actually are being pronounced in Sanskrit, written in, you know, probably Devanagari or something, Gupta script, Devanagari, but their meaning, not the sound, the writing, but what they mean comes from the earlier Pali meaning. This is one of those instances in which the Buddhists use this word pranidhana a little differently than classical Sanskrit. And so it doesn't mean exactly surrendering oneself to a higher power. Although again, I think it's helpful to know that meaning because it, it kind of, yeah, it helps contextualize this a little bit more. Within the Buddhist use of the term pranidhana, the word seems to mean something closer to vow, making a vow. But I want you to know though, that this is where, this is where working with uh, the Chinese language is very, very helpful. If you're really into Buddhist studies, even if you're only interested in Indian Buddhism, and if you're only interested in like Indian Buddhism and Sanskrit and all of that, it would still actually behoove you to learn Chinese because uh, being able to read this medieval Chinese translations of these sutras, it allows us a deep insight into what these words meant way back then. So it's very, very helpful. And so what I'm getting at is, is that now we arrive at this Chinese character. Yuan. And this Chinese character has, you know, much, uh, a very distinct meaning. And it doesn't mean to surrender oneself to a higher power or anything like that. This word is much closer to the idea of a vow. But, um, yeah, I mean, basically, just, just to try to summarize this so we can start looking at the chapter, the Chinese character, even in as it was used in medieval Chinese, like when this uh, sutra was translated, it can basically mean will, like to, to will something. And that kind of is like a wish in a way, kind of like a vow. But I, I guess what I want to suggest is that I bet, <laughs> if you're like me, <laughs> I bet that you've like wished for something. And what I mean by that is, is like, you know, maybe, you know, you, and you may do this a lot. I don't know. But, you know, maybe you, uh, you took the SATs and you wanted to get a good score so you could get into a good college. And maybe after taking the test, you wished, 
oh, I hope I get a good grade. I hope I get a, I hope I get a good score, right? So whatever's going on there, and, and I think it's actually worth, very worth reflecting on what's going on there. Like at a very, very deep level, like what do you actually think might happen? Is this some sort of appeal to God? Is it an appeal to, uh, you know, what magic? Like what exactly is it that you are appealing to? Now, it, it could be like getting a good grade on a test or, you know, maybe you uh, applied for a job and you're really hoping you get it. And so you put out that, that wish, that desire, that whatever that is, and I, again, I want to suggest that we could call it will, like willing in a sense. Whatever's going on there is definitely what the, the one of, if not the connotation of this Chinese character. And it's very much about the idea of pranidhana within the world of Buddhism. It's very much about like wishing and putting out an intention in that way. And as we get into these three great vows or three great pranidhana, um, I think it'll be clearer kind of what's going on here. Um, any questions, comments, answers, or ideas so far? Yeah, Tanya. Um, sorry, I had to get it. the cursor right. Yeah, I was just right before you said intention. I was kept on thinking intention, intention. Yeah, um, which is really, which is, um, it has a very interesting flavor to it compared to like vow, right? It's like, um, mm -hmm. yeah. And people, I don't know if this is related, but you know, people talk about intention like when you're meditating and. You know, so it's like a way of like holding things like so that you're not clinging and clutching at it, but you're setting your mind in, in a certain direction to do something. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, good. Excellent thinking, Tanya. You, you, in fact, you actually took words right out of my mouth. So what I want to, um, and unless there's any other things floating around. Yeah, Annette. I have a weird camera delay right now, but anyway, um, I was curious about the phrasing I see all the time, may something happen? Because I see in that there's like may, and then the Buddha's response is like a declarative kind of proclamation. Mm -hmm. May sounds a lot more wishful or something. Mm -hmm. a, a great, uh, great observation indeed. Uh, in fact, I have even translated this using the may uh, formulation. And so, yeah, most often I can't speak for it across the board, but usually when you see that language in Buddhism, may such and such be the case, they are talking about this pranidhana idea. And on that note, so what I want to make clear is the difference between last week's 10 precepts and tonight's three vows. So these are very related and there's a way in which actually, I forget which translation, it might be Diana Paul's translation that we're kind of using as our baseline. I think she trans, yeah, she does. So I, I wouldn't do this. Uh, and I'm not doing it on my, uh, the version I'm working on, but for example, she calls chapter 10, or sorry, she calls chapter two that we read last week, the 10 ordination vows, but it, it, it's not, they're not vows. That's again, we're talking about vows tonight. So I actually think it's a little, not quite right to call the last chapter vows. Those were precepts. And the difference that I want to make is you'll notice that last week, the 10 precepts and what even the um, uh, kind of original five or original 10 precepts of Buddhism, not taking life, not taking what's not given, not taking sex, uh, false speech, 
uh, and intoxicants, the top five, those are these like avoidances. Precepts are usually in the language of, I, I won't do, I'm not gonna do that. False speech, yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, lying, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. Sorry, that was a repeat. But the idea is, is precepts are about abstaining, avoiding. Uh, often the precepts are phrased in terms of, I will make it a point to avoid, or I will make it a point to not. But my point is, is they're all about actions to be avoided, actions to not take. And then even last week, when we were talking about the 10 uh, Sri Mala Devi's 10 Bodhisattva precepts, it was about not being covetous of other people's property and appearance, not being disrespectful or not being disrespectful to, to elders. So all within the negative language of avoiding and not doing. And when we're in that mode, the abstaining mode, let's call it, that's the realm of shila. That's the realm of moral discipline. Because the idea is, is that we may have innate tendencies to do these different things, or we might just be mindless heathens stomping around killing things and taking that step back and being like, oh, I'm going to avoid killing things. I'm going to try to make it a point not to do that. So that's all within the realm of moral discipline. Tonight, though, we're in the realm of pranidhana. This is a different, uh, a different thing, even though, again, like I just pointed out with uh, translations, these are often conflated as if they're kind of the same thing. And I think they're just often within the same, uh, uh, in the same breath, so to speak. But they're very, two very different things. So let's find out what Sri Mala Devi suggests are the three great vows. Um, and I think I'm going to just, um, yeah, there's not only minor changes the, to the translation I'm working on. So at that time, Sri Mala, again, before the Buddha, made these three great vows saying, may this true vow bring peace to immeasurable, unlimited numbers of beings, and by these good roots, give rise to the attainment of the correct dharma. This is called the first great vow, right? Oh, and so I can... So we have our vows up here now on the board. And so the first one, and you, I just read it in its entirety on the board here. I have summarized it with, um, as I usually do, with just the, the key four Chinese character. Uh, so each of these, it has a key four character section, which really summarizes what the vow is. And so this initial vow she's saying is that it's about bringing peace to unlimited beings by attaining the true dharma, the correct dharma, the right dharma. So that's the first vow. And so right away, you notice it's not in the negative language. It's not about avoiding something. It's actually about wishing or willing something to be the case. In, in, in this situation, Srimala is willing the attainment of the right or correct Dharma. So we need to talk about this term because it's gonna come up a lot. And the term is the correct Dharma. Samyak Dharma or the sad dharma. There's a few different ways that this could possibly have appeared in Sanskrit. The language, though, is pretty straightforward if you're familiar with Buddhism. And what I mean is, 
if you're familiar with the Noble Eightfold Path, you know that the Eightfold Path is all phrased in terms of the right view, right speech, or right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Which always, you know, it implies there's a wrong mindfulness. There's a wrong concentration. There's a wrong livelihood, a wrong way of speaking, a wrong, wrong way of acting, and all of that. So the language is samyak. Um, and you, you see this word a lot in, in Buddhism, samyak. Um, so samyak drishti is right view. And I think it's, it's important to know what that word means. It doesn't really actually mean right and wrong. What right means in terms of, say, the, the Noble Eightfold Path is right means proper. In particular, what it means is conducive to enlightenment. It's proper for enlightenment. It's the, it's the right. So you got to have the right view to get enlightened. There's a bunch of views going around. And there's a way that Buddhism is being very careful. And it's not saying that they have the right view and you have the wrong one. The word samyak, it means conducive to enlightenment, conducive to what we're talking about. So it's right in that sense. The same word is being used here, but not to refer to the right view, right intention, right speech, right action. It's the same word, but it's talking about the right dharma, the right teaching, the right truth, the right information. Now, what exactly is the right dharma? <laughs> well, that's what the sutra is definitely here to tell us. So we don't need to get into that. But that's Sri Maladevi's first vow to reach, to attain this correct dharma, and essentially thereby bringing immeasurable, unlimited numbers of beings peace. Okay. Any questions about the first vow? All right. The second vow. Once attaining the correct dharma, may I explain it to others with an unwearying mind? This is called the second great vow. So the second great vow, well, so the first one is, may I attain the right, correct dharma? And the second vow is, and when I do, may I explain it to others? So again, notice this is not in the negative. It's in the positive. It's in the, may it be the case that I attain the true dharma? May it be the case that I teach it to others? And then finally, may I harmonize, em embrace, absorb? We talked about this word last week. This is the key word for this sutra, parigraha. So may I harmonize, embrace, absorb the correct dharma, abandoning body, life, and wealth to guard and preserve the correct dharma. This is called the third great vow. All right. So the first one is attain the correct dharma. The second one is explain it to others. And the third one is, may I embrace, absorb, or harmonize the correct dharma? by abandoning body, life, and wealth to guard and preserve the correct dharma. 
Questions, comments, answers, or ideas about the three great vows? Yeah, no. Um, earlier, I keep waiting to see if you're going to say this, but earlier you said that the precepts, which are usually in the language of avoidance or abstention, are in the realm of sila. And I was waiting for you to say what the vows were in the realm of. <laughs> well, well, then I'll tell you. <laughs> so I actually just, I read a, um, I was reading with a student of mine, a, a wonderful sutra recently in which we learned that the paramita of pranidana, the great vowing, it works as a complement to virya, effort. It actually, it complements it in that the making of the vow gives us the energy or the drive to keep pers uh, persevering forward in that way. And both the idea of pranidana, the vow, and virya, the energy, both of those have to do with not shila, discipline, they have to do with some kalpa, inten uh, intention, making the right intention and also the right effort. So those two combine. But it's this idea of, of um, putting forth the right effort and doing the, uh, or sorry, putting forth the right intention and producing the right effort. These are what are aided by pranidana and virya in that way. So they have to do with that gnome, if that makes sense. Great, great. Okay. Um, and by the way, just because I, I want to address it now, I mean, it, it could be um, on your mind. So this is one of those, again, a Mahayana Sutra that talks about or uses the language of abandoning body, life, and wealth. So in the effort to preserve and, uh, the correct dharma, she says, may I parigraha, the, the sad dharma, may I embrace the correct dharma and abandon body, life, and wealth. And at first that can sound a little extreme, <laughs> unless we remember what the dharma is, right? <laughs> About non-attachment, no self, all of that, right? Ring a bell. And so I think the idea is, is that we're not talking about throwing oneself in front of a moving object in order to, to practice the Dharma. We're, we're talking about the idea of <clears throat> releasing attachment to the physical body <clears throat> so that we don't freak out over every cough, sneeze, or wrinkle, right? Life is a tricky one, but the idea could be lifestyle, life in general, fear of death, all of that. And then, of course, wealth, which this sutra has focused on a few times now, and it won't be the, the end of it. So helpful to keep in mind, this is Queen, Queen Srimala, whose parents are king and queen Prasanajit, right? And so these are people who have wealth. And this sutra is, in, in many ways, directed towards, uh, I don't even want to call them lay Buddhists, but directed towards bodhisattvas with wealth. I'll put it that way. Okay, so concluding chapter three, chapter three is very short. Um, then the world honored one foretold, predicted of Srimala's three great vows saying, just as all form permeates the realm of space like this, all the vows of the bodhisattvas, as numerous as the sands of the Ganges River, permeate through these three great vows. The truth of these three great vows is that extensive. Okay. Um, by the way, really quickly, I meant to read something to you that I think you'll find interesting over here. So I mentioned uh, at the beginning, 
uh, this sutra that we were going to be reading from Prince Shotoku's commentary on the Srimala Sutra, right? So this is a um, uh, early, very early medieval period Japanese commentary on the sutra that we're reading. And interestingly, when I read, when I read this, I'm just going to read a paragraph, not even a paragraph. But when I read it, I want you to remember that this was written around the year 600 AD in Japan. Might have been written in China, but they claim it was written in Japan by the Japanese uh, emperor or prince. We'll, we'll take it at face value. But it's definitely from at least the year 600, if not earlier. And his commentary, Shotoku's commentary on chapter three that we just read is chapter three begins with Srimala taking the vows, uh, taking the three great vows before the Buddha. And it describes taking refuge in the Mahayana, in the great vehicle, by accepting precepts that differ from those of earlier times. This represents a superior aspiration, one that is an essential part of embracing the eternally abiding body of the Dharma, the Dharmakaya. It differs from the tradition of earlier times, which focused on eliminating suffering by restraining the body and by developing a type of wisdom that eliminates objects of consciousness. So, two things. Even in the year 600 AD, they were talking about how this sutra is different than early Buddhism. So, even that long ago, this sutra was understood to be a second generation Mahayana Buddha Sutra. And something that I'm saying often, and I'm always, uh, I, I love kind of finding other sources to confirm these things I say. Um, but he says this sutra, this chapter in particular, it differs from the tradition of early times, meaning the Hinayana, Shravakayana, right? It differs from the tradition of earlier times, which focused on eliminating suffering by restraining the body and by developing types of wisdom that eliminate objects of consciousness. And he, Shotoku is saying, yeah, that's the old school version where it was about restraint and a type of meditation that was about basically blacking out, not having objects of consciousness. And this is saying, yeah, we, this is the Mahayana. We don't do that. So just that little paragraph, I think, is a tremendous insight into where this sutra fits into the larger kind of framework of Buddhism. Okay, that's it for chapter three. Questions, comments, answers, ideas before we go to chapter four. Robert. Yeah, you were, um, the objects of, of consciousness um, and the blackout meditation. Uh, <laughs> the modus of my questions over the years have, has always been, how does that apply to us in 2021 and my modern practice? Like, I'm not blacking out. What, what does that mean? Good, good call. Good call, Robert. I say these things and, and I'm often like in a conversation with a bunch of other people and don't recognize that these words have meaning beyond what I intend. So when I say the blackout kind of meditation, what I mean is, and it's still um, a practice in the Mahayana, it's just one practice among many versus this like exalted state. But what I mean is, there seems to be, if you study kind of the early Pali canon and you, under, and you study the way they're doing meditation, it would seem that they're really slowing things down and calming things down and stilling the mind to the point where it actually stops and there's no thinking going on 
at all, at all, at all, at all. And you abide in this stillness of nothing. And I'm not necessarily referring to the akim kanya ayatana, the, the base of nothingness, but what that's kind of, you know, that's akin to what I'm referring to. But Robert asked that important question, which is like, but what, what, what would even be with that type of meditation? And there's two things that I always find myself talking about when I, when I get to talking about that deep type of meditation that's about extreme stillness. So two things that I always mention is sleep, <laughs> for one. So the idea is, is that every single night, we enter into a period of being essentially blacked out. It's after we fall asleep, but before we start dreaming, there's a period where there's nothing going on. In fact, there's so nothing going on that we don't even remember that. It could be an hour, however long, and we are just not present then. And then we might have a dream, little mental activity, but then we dip back into that deep, deep rest. And then we wake up. And it's a good thing. <laughs> we need sleep. We need to rest. The body needs to heal. The mind needs to heal. And the idea is, is that if you don't get good, deep rest, you get irritable. You get cranky. You get ornery. All of these things happen when we don't get a good night's sleep. And of course, the body suffers in a variety of ways. It can decrease your immune system, all kinds of things from not getting enough deep, restful sleep. Well, one of the things that it seems that the Buddha was talking about was how that we, especially we humans, benefit greatly from periods of deep stillness. A lot like sleep. But, a di but different though, it's different. But it's a similar situation where, where we are willingly going into a state of absolute stillness where there's nothing going on. So nothing going on that we're not even really, nothing's happening. And then we come out of that meditation feeling refreshed, feeling healed, feeling rested. And basically, as I, as I understand what the Buddha says, if you've never had a deep meditation, it might explain why you're so irritable, why you're so cranky, why you're so ornery. It's because just like nighttime sleep, if a human being has never tasted the peacefulness of a still meditation, they, they haven't fully rested in that sense. So in answer to address Robert's question regarding what I said about that type of deep meditation, it's important. It's considered restful. The other thing that I like to mention, especially because it's very popular in the modern world here, meaning the 21st century modern world, there are these days, I, I don't, I have not experienced this, but I know of, I know about this. There is the therapeutic medicinal use of disassociatives, a variety of disassociative chemicals that, you know, the aboga uh, root is one of them, ketamine, I believe, is one of them, 5-MeO-DMT is one of them, but there are the, these really powerful, deep, uh, you really can't even call them psychedelics, you call them disassociatives. And, you know, I know that there's a lot of different experiences on these things. I, again, have not uh, delved into these waters, so I'm speaking definitely from hearsay. But when I listen to a lot of the more therapeutic accounts, the benefit of these disassociative experiences, it's not what happens during, it's the reintegration process that happens when you come out of that and you maybe don't feel depressed anymore because you've gone through a ketamine kind of ex uh, shock experience or something like that. A lot of these different disassociatives 
are working on what seem like the same samadic principle that it's really good for the samskaras, for the conditioning of the mind to take a break <laughs> from reconditioning themselves all the time. And you can imagine this in terms of like neuroses and anxiety, where when you kind of, and now this is something I can speak of, when you start to get into kind of an anxious spin, it can really start to uh, compound itself and compound itself. And so the idea is that if you're that wound up, it's hard to unwind. It's easier to keep, keep getting wound up in that sense. And so again, in the 21st century, people are experimenting with all of these different chemicals to try to induce a catatonic state so that you can come out of that catatonic state with a little bit of perspective on your life, on your situation. You kind of come out and you're like, oh, wow, I was holding on a little too tightly there. You know, and again, the, the experiences are different, the different uh, therapies are different. So I say all of that as a general, uh, as a general way of talking about the, the benefits of not thinking. Put it, that, put it that way, you know? And I know often that to a thinking mind, the thinking mind is like, you don't wanna do that. You don't wanna stop thinking. That's, no, you'll be lonely, you'll be bored. You don't wanna stop thinking. And of course the idea is, is that we could benefit from that stillness. Okay, that was a wonderful digression into nothingness. Everybody ready for chapter four? Great, because tonight is part four of our talk, and I was hoping that we could at least get into chapter four. The reason why I really was hoping we would make it this far is so I could give you a new slide, <laughs> but also so that my preliminary talk on the lion's roar wouldn't be for nothing. What I mean to say is, is that chapter four really marks the beginning of Queen Sri Mala Devi's lion's roar, okay? So up until this point, we haven't really heard the lion's roar yet. It's tempting to read the opening, her Sri Mala's opening poem, it's tempting to read that as the lion's roar. And, you know, if you read, if you read the Prince Shotoku commentary, he's got all kinds of things to say about when the sutra starts officially. And even he, even Prince Shotoku in the year 600 will tell us that some people think the, the lion's roar begins here and some people think it begins here. Well, I'm one of those people that thinks the lion's roar begins with chapter four. So on that note, then at that time, Sri Mala said to the Buddha, I will now again, by the spiritual power of the Buddha, explain the undifferentiated truth of great vowing or the great vow in that way. The Buddha tells Sri Mala, explain as you like. Okay, um, a lot of, um, especially if you read Prince Shotoku, he's got something to say about every single word. And it's kind of a Buddhist tradition when you read commentaries. It's, it's almost as if if there's nothing to say about a word, we have to make something up because we can't just let a word be a word. So I got to tell you that the opening line here, there's a lot of commentary on it. In particular, a lot of commentary about this idea of by the spiritual power of the Buddha. So this is a, a refrain, I would call it a refrain, it's a trope, it's a, it's a saying that you see a lot in Mahayana Buddha Sutras, 
which is somebody or the, the narrator of a sutra saying that so-and-so spoke by the power of the Buddha, by the spiritual power of the Buddha. Um, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't want to say too much about that because I feel like I, I would be spinning off into commentary land a little bit too much. But I do want you to keep in mind that this sutra started off in a very weird way, which was Srimala having this vision of the Buddha. And that first night, maybe it was part two, the second night, I'm not really sure now, but I made it a point back then to say the Buddha in this sutra is not the Buddha from the Pali Canon. This is a new idea of the Buddha. They're talking, or she was talking about the Buddha's incomparable sublime body that's kind of everywhere like space. And I just mean to say that the Mahayana tradition has a very different idea of the Buddha. And it's that very different idea of the Buddha that they're speaking of when they talk about somebody being empowered it's called Adishtana. When they have the Adishtana of the Buddha, they have the power of the Buddha. They're referring, I believe, to that Buddha. And I'm going to leave it at that for here. But, you know, there, again, because I could really commentate a lot, a lot, a lot about this idea. Yeah, and I, I think, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And it's not going to be left at that, by the way. I just feel like whatever remarks I could say about by the spiritual power of the Buddha, it would be better for me to save them till later. Because it's, it's very much, again, the message of this sutra is about this new Mahayana conception of the Buddha. So, so in other words, Srimala says to the Buddha, I'm going to, I'm going to explain a little more about these vows. <laughs> and the Buddha says, great, that, that would be great. And the key word there, by the way, of course, is explain. That she says, I will now explain the truth of these vows, right? And so that's where I say, this begins the lion's roar. And if you think about it that way, and again, there are, as Shotoku says, there's commentators that also think chapter four is the beginning of, of the sutra proper. You can kind of start to see chapter two and three as these kind of um, preliminary processes that Srimala goes through to sort of I don't want to say prepare herself, but it's these preliminary things that then culminate in her explaining with this lion's roar. So what I mean to say is, is that these, the vows that she took in the last chapter, it's sort of like, you can kind of imagine is that by making the vows, she's now supercharged and like ready to give the, the, the sutra in that way. Okay. Explain away, the Buddha says. Sri Mala said to the Buddha, all the vows of bodhisattvas, as numerous as sands of the Ganges River, are contained in one great vow, which is called embracing the correct dharma, or harmonizing the correct dharma or absorbing the correct or right dharma. Harmonizing the correct dharma is truly the great vow, she says. The Buddha praised Srimala, excellent, excellent wisdom, excellent upaya 
skillful means, most profound, most subtle. You have cultivated virtuous roots for a very long time. People in times to come, those with virtuous faculties will be able to understand as you have explained. Your explanation of harmonizing the correct Dharma is how all the Buddhas, past, future, and present, have explained, are now explaining, and will explain. Having attained the highest awakening, the highest bodhi, I am always explaining this harmonizing the correct dharma. Thus I explain the merit, the punya, of harmonizing, embracing the correct dharma is limitless, boundless, and the thus come ones, pranya wisdom, and discourses are also limitless and boundless. How is it so? This harmonizing the correct dharma has great merit that has great advantages. Okay, I'm going to pause there really quickly. So I want to tell you something wonderful. I want to tell you something wonderful. And I kind of, I, I alluded to it uh, a while ago, uh, maybe the opening night or part two. But so I, I haven't read this sutra since probably graduate school. Um, when I, you know, when I was in graduate school and I was, um, um, well, doing my graduate study, I, of course, I read every sutra I could find. It, you know, I just raided the library. I raided all the collections. And if it was in English, I read it. I was so kind of ravenously interested in the Dharma at that point. And so I've read this sutra a while ago, and I only read it in English. And part of the Dharma Doors, part of this series that I've been doing now for years, is um, now that my Chinese is much better, I'm rereading all these sutras in their original, or in Chinese, in their original, and learning a lot as I go. So this is the first time I've read this sutra in Chinese. And so I started at chapter one, right? I started with all of all of us, I started at the beginning. And in that beginning, in reading Queen Srimala's poem, that original poem, you know, she's extolling the Buddha, the, the virtues of the Buddha, all of this stuff. And I made a point uh, of noting this last time, but as I was reading the opening poem of Srimala, I get to the very last line. And I mean, I wish I could, I wish I could show it to you. And I wish I could walk you through every single character. Well, the first character is actually the, the Yuan, the wish. But the last thing that Srimala says, the last line of her poem is she says, my only wish, my only vow, my only desire is for the Buddha to always embrace me or to harmonize me. And when I was reading the poem, that two character, this, sorry, those two Chinese characters, they popped right out at me. First of all, I had only recently in the last like year or two learned this Chinese character, the one I'm pointing at. And I, I kind of got really infatuated with this, with this character. I was really interested in the idea of samgraha or parigraha and this idea of harmonizing, but it can mean to embrace and absorb. The point is, when I was reading the poem, I got to that last line and that, that word where she says, my only wish is for parigraha. 
it was one of those situations where I was like, Pari Graha, huh? And this, this has been my experience of sutras, almost every single sutra, not even Mahayana, actually, even the Pali ones. There's this way that when you read sutras, in somewhere in the first chapter of every sutra, there's always this conspicuous idea. Like it just sticks out like a sore thumb, just standing there. And every single time I notice a word like that, I'm like, oh, that's a really interesting idea. That's a really interesting word. I'm going to pay attention to that. Then we move on to chapter two and we get the precepts and the 10th precept is about harmonizing the true dharma. And I'm like, wow, this is really weird. And then you get to chapter, well, three, and the third vow is also about harmonizing or absorbing the correct dharma. And then finally, you open up chapter four, and the very title of chapter four is Parigraha. So there's just this way in which I feel like my instincts led me to the, the teaching of the sutra, like what, what the sutra is all about. And what I mean to say is, if you read all the other English translations, they, because they don't really pay much attention to this word, they kind of start to miss the, the point of the sutra. Like it starts to get very, when, when I read some of these English translations, the message is kind of very unclear. It's like, yeah, all the words are on the page, but what they mean, like why is a little lost. And so I'm doing my, my best here to kind of inform you in that sense of what, what this interpreter, what I think is sort of the heart of the teaching here. And so she has laid it out, right? That and this is where it gets interesting, where she says, oh, and by the way, those three vows from last chapter, they can actually all be wrapped up into just one great vow, which is called Parigraha uh, Sadharma, embracing the true Dharma. I've put up here embrace. I'm still working on the language. I still prefer harmony and harmonize, but I just want you to know that it could go from absorb to embrace to harmonize. Okay, so let's see. Let's see. A few more minutes, so let me just read one more part. Chapter four is a little long, so let me just get us a little bit further along for tonight. Shri Mala said to the Buddha, I will now, by the spiritual power of the Buddha, further explain the extensive, broad, vipulya, the extensive meaning of harmonizing the true Dharma or correct dharma. The Buddha said, please explain further. Srimala said to the Buddha, the extensive, broad, the word is vipulya, the extensive meaning of harmonizing the correct dharma, embracing the correct dharma, the extensive meaning of harmonizing the correct dharma is immeasurable, containing all dharmas of the Buddhas, harmonizing 84,000 different dharma doors. Just like at the beginning of a kalpa, when a great cloud rains multicolored rain, all with rains multicolored rain of all kinds of jewels everywhere. Just like this, 
harmonizing the correct dharma rains immeasurable rewards and immeasurable rain for virtuous faculties. Okay, I'm going to talk about that really quickly. So, Srimala, first, the first thing she said is, oh yeah, all the vows. And I also want to remind you of that great part too, where the Buddha said, all the vows of bodhisattvas, as numerous as the sands of the Ganges River, are all actually contained in those three great vows. And then Sri Mala says, and you know what? All three of those vows are actually contained in this one great vow called harmonizing the Dharma. So basically, if you don't want to know what harmonizing the Dharma means now, <laughs> you, you don't care about the Dharma. <laughs> in, in other words, what I mean is, is that this sutra is just like fishing for you to really want to know what this idea means. I, I'm also trying to say that if, you've, if you're reading this at home, they haven't told us what it means yet. Like they're, they're doing this on purpose, right? So she says that actually all of the vows can be reduced to just this one vow called this. And then to illustrate her point, Srimala, and this is kind of, um, well, it's not the entirety of this chapter, but it's a big, a big chunk of this chapter, is she's about to give a series of metaphors, similes actually, because it's going to be like different things. And these similes, and it's unfortunate that I don't have enough time tonight to go through all of them. So it, that'll be where we really dive deep next time. But just to let you know, these similes are very elemental. So this first one actually has to do with water or rain or air in that way. And Srimala is referring to this um, Buddhist cosmological vision of the creation of the multiverse that begins with this giant uh, vortex of wind, spinning vortex. And what happens is, is that during this kind of Big Bang creation moment of Buddhism, this giant rainstorm happens that just kind of rains. I mean, she talks about it in terms of jewels, multicolored jewels, but the original cosmological myth is that kind of all of the you know, all the elements, the periodic table in a way are being rained down everywhere. And there's this kind of uh, tumult that is churning up all of creation. And that, that period, which is this period of creation, eventually settles down into a period of life, of being, of existence in that way, of course, until things start to decay. Okay, so she's referring to that. And she's basically saying or giving this analogy that just in the same way that that original cloud storm contains all possibility of creation, contains all the elements, the entire periodic table, everything to make life. Similarly, just like that, harmonizing this correct dharma is like, or it's immeasurable, and it contains all the Buddha dharmas, all 84,000 different dharma doors, all right? So tonight, uh, I'm going to have to make this super duper quick. I mentioned at the first night when I talked about the title that this sutra is called a Vaipulya Sutra. 
a broad or extensive Mahayana Sutra. And what that means, that word Vipulya, a broad or extensive sutra, what that actually means is, and she said it, it means that a sutra like this, and not only that, this vow contains all 84,000 Dharma doors. So I, I did a, my Dharma talk full circle. We managed to do it. But all 84,000 of the original Dharma doors, the original, all the Buddha Dharma, are understood to be contained in this one sutra. Again, not only that, they're actually all contained in this one great vow. All right. Sorry, I won't have uh, time for long question and answer. Anything super pressing though?